computer. Right, okay. I think that's the housekeeping finished at last. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, now, before we launch into the, the meat of the topic, and that's the first pun of the, of the evening, uh, I'd just like to explain a little bit about uh, why slow food should be interested in crofting. Uh, and really, it, it's, <laughs> slow food is an international uh, movement. Uh, and if we look across the, the world, we can see that, uh, that there are lots of local small scale farming taking place in remote, usually in remote areas, farming with crops and animals that uh, uh, that suit the local weather patterns and the, the nature of the local terroir. Uh, and food is largely produced for the consumption of the farmers and the, their families. It could also be shared within the community, uh, and that community is a, an important part of slow food as well. Uh, and um, uh, the community itself can also sometimes band together. I, and we've seen examples of that in, in Scotland, uh, for example, with the, the North Ronald Sea sheep, where the, the whole of the, the community really get together to, to take the sheep off the, 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 uh, the coastline and uh, put it into, uh, get it ready for market, basically. Uh, and um, there are um, I, often also some of the, uh, the, the products of, of that kind of small scale farming can be used uh, in other products which are produced in the, the local community. And again, you can look at things like bear meal, which is uh, used for beer, it's used for whiskey, it's used for vinegar, uh, as well as making bread and things like that. Uh, so, so there are ways that, uh, I, I, that, that it can spread into the community. Uh, the other aspect which is, uh, which is very much slow food is the fact that uh, you often find in those places uh, the, the, the practices rely on very traditional methods, but also rely on using some of the traditional uh, varieties of either uh, animal or crops. Uh, and we can find that some of those uh, have disappeared from the rest of, the, of, of Scotland, for example, uh, and are, um, are very much uh, it potentially in decline, in fact, uh, at risk. And these are the kind of... Um, products and, uh, and animals which we would put into the arc of taste, the slow food arc of taste. Uh, and and that, that's kind of, um, it, it kind of gets you to, to understand some of the reasons why we think this is important, uh, that, that that kind of, of uh, uh, those kind of practices uh, are important uh, in, in terms of preservation uh, of, of breeds and crops uh, and, and also in, in knowing that it's good, local and sustainable, because some of these practices have been uh, in hand since well before the, the Industrial Revolution. So they're, they're sustainable just by fact because of that. I, and I guess I, Patrick will probably come and talk aspects of this, but uh, there are things which uh, would try and mitigate against that. Uh, for example, the use of, of uh, pesticides and, uh, and fertilizers. Uh, and, and, and in many cases, I, I suspect that uh, the, the size of, of, of uh, the, the type of farming that we're talking about here might make it much better for them to stick to traditional techniques anyway. Uh, so crofting is obviously Scotland's example of that, I, and um, I will be hearing about that in a minute. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to, to hand over to Vicky Allen. Uh, now, Vicky's going to be the moderator for the, the session here. Uh, she's the senior features writer at the Glasgow Herald, and I've had a quick look at some of her recent articles, and many of them feature the, the impact of waste on the environment, climate change, COP26. Uh, there was one on the Black Houses on, uh, on the Western Isles. I also noted that, <laughs> that there was one on how to have great sex after 50. Uh, <laughs> We, we won't be inviting questions on that topic today. <laughs> uh, That's for another <laughs> slow food event. <laughs> but, but I have to say it stood out. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to hand over to Vicky now and uh, if you'd like to introduce Patrick. Yeah, so yes, it's, it's, it's a real pleasure to introduce Pat, Patrick Krause, who's the CEO of the Scottish Crop Dig Federation, and um, he's going to give us a wonderful talk, which I know from having chatted with him is going to range over quite a lot of different territory and issues. And, um, and of course, as Walter just mentioned, if, you know, if, if as you're listening, you want to put a question on the chat box 
that would be great because I'm going to be feeding them through um, to him later as well as some of my own questions. So anyway, over to Patrick. Okay, great. Well, I love I love in the introduction <laughs> when, when you say Patrick's going to give a wonderful talk. And <laughs> I think, oh, right, okay. I will do my level best. Um, I'll start off just by saying a wee bit about well, actually, I was going to say a wee bit about the organisation. If, if before I do that, I just want want to say, um, Walter was talking about the Terra Madre, and um, we have at least on two occasions had a posse of crofters go to the Terra Madre, and and they thoroughly enjoyed it. And from the feedback we got, um, people really enjoyed the fact that the crofters were there, and and um, you know, giving um, talks about about what crofting's about. So, so that connection that that Walter was was saying, it, it's a very real live connection. You know, the small small holders of the world do really um, connect and understand each other. So, um, and I should also say that I'm very pleased to see amongst the participants here my colleague and good friend Donald Murdy so he is a he is an actual crofter and um and I'll explain why why I'm saying that and so um you know when questions come up um he is one of the most knowledgeable people that I know um in the field of crofting so he hopefully will help me out if you ask anything that I can't answer so if I just say um the SCF, the Scottish Crofting Federation, um, has been around as an organisation um, since 1985. Um, it used to be called the Scottish Crofters Union, um, and it changed its name in 2001 for, for some re a variety of reasons, which I, I can explain later if you want. But, um, we're, it's now called the Scottish Crofting Federation um, and is a registered charity. But our main aim, we're actually still really a union. And um, our main purpose is to represent crofters. We're the only organization actually, we're the only organization that is dedicated to representing crofters. So we're also the, the, um, the largest association of small, producers in the UK. And about me, um, I've been working as the chief executive for the, the, the Federation since 2003. And um, I was just saying to Walter before this started, because he said, how did you get into doing doing that? And it's, it, it was sort of a um, one of these roads that you follow and things just just happen in a very sort of natural way. So I used to work in overseas development and um, it was with an organization that was primarily training community animal health workers. And um, there was a, a European network that we belonged to and we were looking at training community animal health workers in Europe as well as in Africa and Asia, um, which is where we worked mostly. And um, this sort of led me to a connection with um, the crofting or the crofters union as it was then. And um, one thing led to another and eventually a job came up and I took the opportunity to work in Scotland rather than um, overseas. And um, and I'm still doing it because I've enjoyed it so much. So um, that's a little bit about me. What I'm gonna do now is I'm going to show you some slides because pictures definitely work in this context a lot better than, than words. Um, so I've actually got quite a few slides but the idea is that I'm going to rattle through them fairly quickly and just speak to them. So the most important thing about 
an event like this I have always found is the discussion afterwards. So if I just go through these to try and um, stir up some thoughts about crofting, um, maybe stir up some questions that you want to ask that I don't cover, and let's um, aim to have a good discussion when I've finished. So if Walter, if you could make me the host, which I think I am now, and if I screen share, let's see whether this all works. Okay, so if Walter, if you could tell me, does this, is it looking like a, a slideshow? Yes, it is. Great. So, <clears throat> it's an interesting title um, which Lucia gave me. And the survivor is, it's not that I'm a survivor. <laughs> Well, I hope I am, <laughs> but it's, it, was, it was in the context of how, how are we going to survive? Um, and I think this is a very pertinent question, um, given what's happening in Glasgow um, as we speak, the gathering of people who are going to decide how they're going to try and enable us to survive. So that's really where that came from. Um, this is um, a picture of um, Strath Kildonan, which is in, in the empty heart of Sutherland, as they say. And you can see here there's um, what used to be a rich crofting community or at that time it was actually small tenant farmers, but it was a rich community here and it was cleared. Um, and Sutherland was particularly notorious for, for clearing its um, small tenant farmers to make way for sheep. And you'll see the irony of this as we progress in the talk, the fact that these people, these families were moved off the land to make way for sheep and this, this was all taking place in the 18th and 19th century. And people were moved out to the, to the fringes, to, so to the coastal areas and to um, the islands of, of Scotland. And this was, this was all to do with industrialization and agricultural improvement. And I'm sad to say we've seen other attempts at agricultural improvement as well, that maybe not quite as dramatic as, as what happened here, but um, clearances nonetheless. So there's an adage that, that a croft is a small piece of land surrounded by a sea of legislation. And the reason for this is that um, our, as, as people were cleared and, and were living um, in these more remote and, and fragile, difficult areas, um, there was a lot of unrest about this and, and there was um, an inquiry into it by the, um, the UK government at the time, which led to legislation being passed, the 1886 Crofters Act. And um, this is still the foundation of um, crofting legislation at the moment. And that's really, in a, in a way, what defines crofting. Um, you know, people have all sorts of definitions for, for what crofting is, but in its most basic form, it's um, a form of land tenure that is governed by a very specific piece of legislation. Um, this is a monument um, in Helmsdale, uh, a, a monument to the crofters um, called the immigrants and it's, it's to um, pay homage really to the people that were moved off the land so this is that that first picture 
um, is at one end of the of the the Strath, and Helmsdale is at the other end of the Strath on the coast, and the monument was um, erected there, commemorating the fact that so many people uh, had to leave, not not only leave this part of Scotland but leave Scotland completely, and you can see in the background um, strips of croftland. So this is um, the area of Scotland that's covered by the legislation. Um, the reason that it's where it is, is, is that it was, the legislation was enacted um, and moved across Scotland with the intention that, that all of Scotland was going to um, be under the legislation. But the, the landowners resisted this and this is the um, this is as far as the crofting um, legislation um, managed to get. So something that we have as an ambition, a long term ambition, is that that legislation will one day roll out and cover the whole of Scotland, and we'll see um, crofts across the whole of Scotland. So this this area. Um, of land equates to um, about 770,000 hectares of agricultural land under crofting tenure, which represents about a quarter of the agricultural um, land of the highlands and islands. Um, there's a, this one's a funny one. There's, so, there's in the region <laughs> of um, 18 to 21,000 crofts. Now, the reason that this is a bit odd is that there was a very clear um, number of crofts because they all have to be registered. And then through a, a, a strange quirk in the legislation, um, loose shares, um, which are shares in the common grazing. Um, some of these loose shares are now deemed as crofts. And so even though there are still the original 18,600 and something registered crofts, there are pieces of common grazing that are registered now as deemed crofts. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about the legislation as, as, as we go on but that's one of the reasons why the legislation really needs tidying up so crofts are of various sizes um the the average they say is about five hectares there there are some much bigger than that and some much smaller than that obviously being an average um and there's an a great variety in what goes on on the crofts. Um, there's 16,000 registered crofters. So whilst the crofts are registered, the, the crofter is, is registered. There's less registered crofters than crofts, simply because some crofters have more than one croft. Um, so the figure that the commission gives is around 16,000 registered crofters at the moment and um, crofting is really about the family so so when it's you know when we talk about there being 16,000 registered crofters it's 16,000 crofting families which actually equates to a lot of people um, and it is certainly something that is a multi-generational intergenerational um, livelihood. So this is sort of a pretty common layout of, of a crofting township. Crofts tend to have what people call the croft, um, the in by, which is the small piece of land, um, you know, used for a whole variety of things, including growing um, fodder and and so on for the animals, but also for growing um, food for 
um, for the crofters and the crofting family. And then most crofts still have a share in common grazings. So, so for example, here, um, the township is in, in the foreground and, and this is where, the, where the, the crofts are. And in the background is the hill ground, which would be um, common grazing. And indeed, probably right in the foreground is common grazing as well. I think the, um, something that's very important about crofting is that it's, it's a piece of land, but it's also a home. Um, it's, it's a job. It gives the crofter a foothold in what can be quite difficult circumstances. You know, employment in these areas is very sporadic or seasonal or, or just hard, hard to find. So, you know, having, having this um, foothold makes a big difference to whether somebody can survive here. This particular one is in Shetland. So the, the, the largest output by far actually is still livestock. Um, sheep, Lerg, for example, this is the, um, the sheep sale in Lerg. So, so most of the sheep are, are sold into the store trade. So, so this is young sheep that are bought in the mart to be um, taken away to be fattened elsewhere on lusher pa pastures. Crofting stock is very well sought after um, by traders and fatteners because of the um, high health status, but also because they've been born and raised on um, more rough grazing, they fatten very quickly when they're put on to richer grazing. And um, some of the traditional breeds are still used and people do still use traditional um, practices such as hand shearing. And of course, crofters do still keep cattle. Um, crofters historically, originally were cattle keepers. And um, so whilst they, a lot of crofters do keep sheep now, you'll see what I meant about the irony of, of the clearances and these people, these families being moved to make way for, for sheep. And now um, a lot of crofters swear that crofting is just about sheep. <laughs> and a lot of crofters will swear that it's not, it's about cattle. And of course, many crofters keep both sheep and cattle. And of course, there's the iconic um, native breeds um, that people come from all over the world to see. But crofters also um, have always, always this term diversification. Um, it, it, I think in, in, in crofting, it's not really um, considered diversification, it's just crofting. And crofters have always grown food for themselves as well as growing um, things and um, animals to, to sell that they, they produce for themselves as well, obviously. And this particular croft, um, the trees in the background have cattle um, grazing under the trees, which makes a lot of sense. And um, of course, this growing of food is now helped by modern technology. I know polytunnels have been around for an awful long time, but um, I guess it's something that has made a, a big difference in, in um, growing fruit and veg. And um, certainly the person that I mentioned earlier, Donald Murdy, who's here, um, he does a lot of stuff with um, growing. He and his wife do a lot of stuff on um, horticulture and have um, contributed a lot to um, our training courses and our um, manual, our horticultural manual for crofters that was written specifically for horticulture in the crofting areas. 
And there's all sorts of other things going on. People um, keep poultry, of course, and um, we sell in markets and sell direct. And this very much, I think, is something that that is um, the future. It's, in, it's it's interesting, actually, this whole thing about about local markets um, and local food. I can remember um, talking to a minister when I hadn't been in a job for that long and talking about local food and the minister dismissing it and saying, Puh, you know, that that's only something like 0.05% of production. And it's, it, you know, it's not something that we pay any attention to. And now, of course, there's, um, currently even um, a consultation out on local food and people have realized how in, or the government I think a lot of us realized how important it was anyway but government are actually understanding now that local food production um, short supply chains um, are really important and are something something that is part part of the future and the pandemic sort of brought this home a bit as well, as well as the climate emergency, the pandemic um, increased the demand for local food because um, obviously pe people being locked down, but also people not wanting to um, go into shops as much. And so we're looking for um, access to food direct from producers. And of course, um, I show this picture because um, it's particularly pertinent for, for this talk with slow food um, because food tourism is, is becoming uh, more recognized, you know, that people do travel sometimes specifically looking, looking for um, a gastronomic experience but it's also that the food, the, the, it, it might not be specifically looking for food, but that food is a very important part of the um, tourism or the, the, the visiting experience. We can talk about tourism and that a bit, a bit more later. Um, and I haven't got a picture of a holiday cottage, but of course something that crofters do um, benefit from is this increase in in tourism and um, the provision of tourist accommodation and providing food to the tourist industry and there's the other side to it of course as well but we'll talk about that later um, and then as I move into closing I just want to talk a, a wee bit about the fact that um, producing food isn't just about producing food, as you well know, and um, it's about how we produce food, um, who is producing it. So, so we, we talk a lot about the fact that crofting is about the people. Um, crofting is also very much about the planet. And this is being drawn into sharp focus at the moment, as I said at the beginning. But it's it's really good to see that that um, crofting is being seen to be coming into its own now. I think, and a lot of the virtues of crofting are being appreciated more. The main being that it's it's environmentally friendly, and indeed, you know, well managed grazings can increase biodiversity. Um, so this, this um, picture here, if you'll just excuse me a minute, I just need to, that's the trouble, being the host, I have to press the, the, um, the door unlocking mechanism <laughs> to let somebody in. So, so this map, there's um, a, a European, or this, it, it, it started in, in Europe, this um, recognition of high nature value farming and um and a, a very um 
robust system of criteria was developed over quite a long, a long period um, under which things could, you know, areas could be, um, I, I was gonna say designated high nature value. It's, I have to be careful using that term just because it's not a designated site in, the, in, in, in that sense as the, the, that we have. Um, but anyway, the, the, the point is that, that there are high nature value areas that are recognized internationally. And um, so, it, so the picture on the left shows the high nature value areas across Europe. And the picture on the right obviously shows the high nature value areas in Scotland. And just to remind you where the um, crofting areas are, um, well, I don't need to say anything, do I? And then the last thing I want to say is, is um, in connection with the climate change emergency, um, there's a, a big thing being made about the peatlands and about peatland restoration um, for obvious reasons, you know, that the peatland locks in, I, I just read, read today somewhere that, that the peatlands of the world store more than twice the amount of carbon than all the trees in the world. And we have a lot of peatland in Scotland and a lot of that peatland again is in the crofting areas. So how this actually um, develops will be quite interesting to see. But a lot of, you know, most of the peatland that, that is crofted is well managed. And there are some examples of it um, where, where it has been damaged and needs restoration. And this is um, a big objective of the Scottish government is to restore all of our peatlands. Uh, this last slide, uh, the idea of the wall, the reason I show this slide is that, that I, it's always struck me how tenacious crofters are. You know, building a wall over a, a dry stone dike over a hill is no mean feat. Anyway, so crofters are still here, despite the fact that um, there are constraints and the, the main constraints that I'll just touch on now, but I'm sure others will come, come out in our discussion, is, is that some areas are depopulating. Young people are finding it very difficult to stay in the areas, in the crofting areas, particularly because land and um, housing are becoming more and more expensive. This has really hit, hit a crisis point now. Um, some of you may have seen this sort of quite a lot of stuff going on in the press, in the media now, about this, this problem that we're having where you know crofts the price of crofts is excluding local people and and young people um, from from the market um, and at the same time though there are there are sort of quite quite a, a number of crofts that aren't being used or aren't being used enough um, or crofts that have been abandoned completely and being a regulated system we want to see this being addressed um, and part of this is is that the commission which is the regulator needs to be resourced sufficiently to regulate properly and the legislation needs reforming so so as i said at the beginning um, the main legislation was, was written in 1886, or, or that's when it became law, and um, there's been various acts passed since, but the last time that the law was um, consolidated was in um, 1994, so, so we're still um, operating under under the 1994, even though since 1994, there's been several other acts passed. Um, so it's all becoming a bit, a bit messy. So I'll leave it there with my thanks and 
I'll try and work out how to pass this back to Walter. So let's have a look. Right. Maybe you don't need to. Do you need to pass it back? No. Nope. Maybe we can just fire ahead. <laughs> sure. Oh, I don't know, Walter. What do you reckon? Um, just, just go ahead. <coughs> just go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, interesting what you were saying about the Crofting Commission, and um, I'm just wondering if, um, if you know, there are certain rules, things that you have to do with the croft, or or you lose your croft type thing. Yeah. The, the 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 thing that was good about the legislation is is that the legislation was um designed to firstly give um the crofters some protection and um but then it's a it's sort of a a, a three a three pronged legislation i think of it as because it gives the the crofters protection but it also gives the landlords um a a, a protection or a lease that is understandable and um that both parties know know what what their duties and their responsibilities are and then thirdly um it protects the land so um croft land is in generally in much better condition than a lot of um of other agricultural land and indeed the population of the crofting areas is, is in better condition as well because of the, the legislation. So the main duties of the crofter are to live on or near the croft and to use the croft. So that's, that's, that's really the main duties and they're protected um, by having heritable tenancy um, and a, protect, a, a sort of protection of what the rent um, can be set at. Um, so, so the Scottish Land Court um, protects the rent, which is always low anyway. And um, any, if a croft is passed on, any permanent improvements um, have to be compensated for. I should say, I meant to say this actually, um, that most, most crofters are tenants still, and the legislation was written specifically for this relationship between tenant and landlord um, there are now some owner occupier crofters who um, under the 1975 act were given um, the right to buy the croft and th this it's um, th this was actually for a couple of reasons one one was um, to give them extra protection against um, obstructive landlords, but it was also to, to give them um, the ability to decroft parts of, of crofts in order to um, raise finance against it, because um, you can't get a loan from a bank on, on croft land. Mm. Anyway, sorry, that was a very- No, long that's long. really interesting. And I mean, I suppose one, one of the things that makes me think about is the fact that obviously you're talking about it's a relationship to the land and, and the legislation. Um, but um, I think a lot of us think of, of crofting traditions, you know, that it's a particular, that there are particular things that crofters do. And it's about keeping a culture of a particular way of farming the land alive. I mean, is that is that is that still the case, or is that sort of changing a lot? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question because um, there are very much um, a lot of traditional practices still still carried out, and and the culture of crofting is incredibly important. It's you know, crofters um, definitely feel that they are crofters and there is a very strong culture behind this. Um, I think it's, it's important as well though to not confuse the fact that there are often older traditional methods used with this meaning that it's an old fashioned um, 
sort of antiquated way of doing things because it because it isn't at all. I mean, I'm, the reason I say this is that it, that it was um, it was viewed as this. I, I can remember a government official um, once saying saying in a public meeting referring to crofting as an anachronism. Um, you know, there's this sort of idea that that crofting is stuck in a time warp, but it's it's not like that whatsoever. It's it's the way I look at it is that new. It was like I like I referred to earlier um, when I said said um, about agricultural improvement and that it happened. Um, in the 18th century to the detriment of a lot of um, communities and um, and it's happened again again since and you know something that that happened under the common agricultural policy um, was this this embracing an industrialization of agriculture and I think that, when you, when you look at what's happened um, and where we're going now with the emergencies of, of climate change and the loss of biodiversity, I think that it's becoming fairly widely accepted now that that, that agricultural improvement was um, a failed or is a failed experiment. And the, the looking now at more traditional um, time-tested ways of, of doing things like crofting, and of course, crofting isn't alone in this, there's the, the, there are small farms working away like this all over Europe and indeed all over the world. And I think the, the recognition for that and the, the part that they play is um, is increasing and has to increase because of the situation that we are finding ourselves in. I mean, it is fascinating to look at the map that you put up earlier, which actually we can still see up there with the with the black area, which maps to the the same area as the crofting area. That because obviously we're talking a lot about, about rewilding now and, um, you know, possibly rewilding vast tracts of land. Um, and sometimes that can seem like a, a, a Scotland in which people don't really feature, but you're talking about biodiversity levels in areas of land where people are there. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a shame really that, that this world, this word, <laughs> this world, <laughs> It probably is. Um, this word rewilding um, is sort of, uh, it's not misused, that's the wrong, wrong word, it's, it's maybe misinterpreted a bit. Um, and I think it, it's, it, you know, that what's caused that has, has been um, instances that don't happen so much now, but instances a few years ago of where where rewilding got um, promoted in the media, not by the media, but but by some organizations um, that ad advocated this idea that that land should be returned to nature um, and that human humans should be excluded from this land and 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 that that's that sort of the the pure rewilding is just let everything go back to nature and i don't think that this is um you know luckily i think that think there's a lot more conversation about what rewilding is now and um and so even though the word rewilding is still used uh i think the 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 idea of um, natural processes being allowed to take place more um, in contact with people is being accepted. 
and you know crofters have worked with nature um always and and have had to you know particularly you know crofting takes place in very fragile areas and so yeah i mean it's a good example of of why people have to be careful with the landscape but as i was saying that i was just the reason i was pausing then was because as i was saying that i was thinking that of course what we're understanding now is that we all live in a in a very fragile area the the planet is a fragile area and um working with nature um is something that that we don't have a have um a choice about i don't think it's something that of course we have to do and it's 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 what 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 traditionally people have done and have understood why and and you know until you get this this really very recent um intervention that that decided to try to industrialize agriculture and food production i wondered if even um crofting is becoming more diverse then you know it's like a, a diversity of practices maybe I think when we talked before, you were talking about going back to some more tra traditional breeds of, um, you know, older traditional breeds of sheep and. Yeah, it, it's I mean, it's an interesting point because, you know, a lot a lot of a lot of crofters have stayed with um, traditional breeds. Uh, I, I remember. Um, being in Shetland and asking um, a, a, a Shetland crofter that I was with, um, and a, a, a lot of Shetlanders keep Shetland sheep, and and I asked him um, why specifically he kept Shetland sheep, and he said, and he said because they live, they manage to live through the winter, and um, and it, and he wasn't joking, you know that that in a harsh climate, obviously one of the the things that you're looking for in in your stock is that they survive so you know a lot a lot of the native um animals can survive and do really well in in the harsh climates that that, that we have in in scotland and you know a lot of the newer um exotics that were tried again failed experiment type of <clears throat> um scenario i mean there's some you know stories about exotics that that were introduced and didn't make it mm. um you know but but i think on the whole crofters tend to to use not only the older um native breeds but the maybe what you think of as sort of intermediates that maybe aren't aren't the original breeds but aren't aren't mm. exotic either you know they're and it, and it's about surviving I'm going to actually put a question to you from the start, start taking some questions from the chat. So I've got one here from Stan Blackley. Can you talk to, to the connections between crofting, indigeneity and galdom? I regularly come across the view that proper crofters are local, born and bred and speak Gaelic. Yet that doesn't seem to be the lived reality in which some of the best cro crofters are incomers. Do you... The, or the Scottish Crofting Federation have a view on this. Oh, that's a that's a pertinent question, isn't it? I'd, I'd expect nothing less from from Stan. Um, I've the the SCF doesn't have a a, a strong view, particularly um, when it comes to whether we're saying somebody is a crofter or not because of what language they speak or where they originally come from. So, you know, and, and I know that there has been, um, it's, 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 I'm trying to find the tactful way of saying this um, because of course, as, as Stan says in that, in that, um question 
there are many, many really excellent crofters who have come from elsewhere and have been crofting for a long time, but can't necessarily say that their ancestors were, were, were crofters, but they're really good crofters. And this connection between the Gallic language and crofting, of course, a lot of older crofters in certain areas may come from the Gallic tradition, but equally a lot of crofters in the Northern Isles, for example, don't come from the Gallic tradition. So, you know, whilst there are different languages and different cultural um, heritage in crofting, I think the thing that, that is important is that the, the, the culture of crofting itself is really strong and important. Well, something that I have always found really interesting, I, I sort of mentioned this at, at the beginning about crofters going to the Terra Madre, and um, the smallholders and farmers and pastoralists from the world over share a common understanding and that really deep culture I think is far more important than whether your ancestry comes from a certain place or whether um, your family speaks a certain language. I mean I say I say this because it, it also because of this connection that I personally have of having worked in um, a few other areas in the world with pastoral people. And the, the connection is really strong. We actually had some Maasai pastoralists come over to, to Skye on a, on a study trip. And um, I just remember standing in a room with crofters and Maasai and everyone was talking and, and everyone was sharing a really strong common bond. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna ask another question, Patrick. Is, is there any optimism with regards to the development of small accessible abattoirs? Oh God, <laughs> I mean, this, this is... <laughs> <laughs> my my colleague Donald that I mentioned um, did a lot of work on this. We've been trying to get a, an abattoir in Sky, and the government haven't been um, very enthusiastic about this. And there's been there's been various trials and attempts, and um, I think. Well, on, on the one hand, I think part of the problem is this industrialization psyche, um, the, this, you know, this idea of centralizing everything, having big industrial units, and that everyone has to take their animals from all over the country to this central point where um, slaughter can take place, and then they cart, cart the carcasses away again instead of it being done in a in a much smaller um more humane way and um but looking at it optimistically like i said there's a consultation out at the moment on um local food and i think that the um the idea of localizing things is is getting more traction now. I see. I see. So, sorry, I'm not the chair, but I see that Donald has raised his hand. So, you know, maybe he does he want to say something? Do you want to actually? Um, well, the, uh, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, having been involved in 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 the struggle for a, a local laboratory for for over ten years, um. 
yeah, it's a huge issue in, in, in many, many places in, in Scotland. Um, and at, at some point, at some point in time, it's going to have to be addressed. The, uh, the Scottish government and its civil servants has kind of hidden behind the, the European Union and, and, and state aid rules. Uh, currently, they, 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 don't, they don't have that particular place to, to hide. The, um, uh, the goalposts continuously move on this and the subject gets gets kind of kicked into the long grass over you know things like mobile abattoirs and such like um we we've studied we've done a study in mobile abattoirs i think it was in 2005 and and so 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 we know uh, we know the issues all around that but it it's it's a it's a delaying tactic the problem is um uh Nobody in the right mind is going to open an abattoir as a business. Uh, it, it, it's 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 just not paying proposition uh, unless there's a lot of added value down the line, like um, uh, like butchery, uh, packaging, marketing, you know, and all these things, which of course which of course can be done because you put a brand on something like the Isle of Skye, um, then. Then it's got to sell. Uh, uh, so, so, so you've got you've got to have all that uh, uh, subsequent to the actual slaughtering of the animal and 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 hanging it up in a chill room. Um, the, 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 there's a good example of how it can work, which is in a similar situation, Isle of Mull, and uh, uh, Mull uh, has done this with with great success. It's a it's a constant struggle it's a constant struggle with costs and bureaucracy um but but you know for you people uh, in this meeting it is it's obviously it's a huge it's a huge issue because it's about welfare it's about quality it's about provenance and it's about sustainability um so uh, you know all the lobbying you can do with politicians and whoever else, the better. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, I'm, I, I need to apologize because I um, I only allowed myself the time to run on to 7.30. So I'm gonna um, pass over the next question to, um, to Patrick and um, and then I'm gonna have to scoot off. I'm really, really sorry, because it's fascinating. But um, but um, the um, I think the, there was another question really from Stan, which was really about the way so much land is owned by so few people. Um, and Patrick, I was just wondering, if, he was really wondering if you had any thoughts on that and how, you know, how, you know, whether that it's possible to change all that. Yeah, I was just flicking down through the um through the questions, and I think somebody else also asked that earlier. So, so I was hoping that you were going to going to come to that one. Um, the S SCF is is very keen on land reform, and has been since since its early days as a union. You know, crofting law reform is actually part of the the land reform um agenda the idea that so few people own so much of scotland is completely wrong and is completely in opposition to what what we argue is something that makes crofting so good you know we something central to to land reform um at the beginning of the process of of the land reform um act the the um 2003 i think it was um it was very strong on the point that more people need to be involved in living on and using the land in scotland and we completely support that and and what we want to see is more crofts created and there are some crofts being created in in particularly on community owned estates but we want to see crofts created all over 
you know it's a it's a good system and the legislation whilst being um in a state of disrepair is probably the kindest way to put it it's good it's good legislation and the idea of having more tenanted um small holdings that that come under crofting legislation um i.e they are crofts um it would be very welcome all right so I hope, I hope that sort of answers that and if if it doesn't then then please I was just going to say uh, that um, since Vicky's uh, disappeared now, I, I'll continue for just a few minutes. Um, can I just ask a question about uh, what it is that, uh, that, that you have to assess if you're creating a new croft, if you're trying to assign that to a new crofter? I mean, you, you, there are regulations around it. I mean, it, is it a... Uh, is it a big hurdle for somebody to, to overcome to create to get a croft created and then is it a, another big hurdle for them to be able to be allowed to run it as a crofter? Mm, there's, I think there's, you're talking about two different things here. Yeah. Um, the creation of, of crofts isn't that, isn't that difficult. It's, a, it's about having um, the land. So for example, a community landlord um well any landlord mm -hmm. um can create crofts you know so so if a landlord is the owner of of a large estate there's nothing stopping them at all from um taking some of the land dividing it into um smaller units and then asking the crofting commission to um give them the status to register them to give them the status of of being crofts and it's a very straightforward process but it's the landlord that has to do this um we're trying to encourage landlords to consider doing this because you know they're protected they're not losing the ownership of that land mm -hmm. you know they're they're creating um places for families to live and thrive and they're protected by the um the lease that they have have with that crofting family so you know think think of the pr the 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 good pr that that would have for the landlords you know i mean i think everyone finds it quite difficult to understand how we've got into this position that so few people own so much of Scotland. People that, that perhaps don't even live in Scotland and own vast tracts of particularly the Highlands and Islands. You know, and I think people find that really difficult to understand. So, you know, the land the landlords would do themselves a big favor, I think, to consider um, creating crofts. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of what you asked there, Walter, was um was more about the tenant, you know, how difficult, I think that's what you're asking, is how difficult yes. is it for the tenant to be, to be a tenant? I mean, the, the, main, the main thing that's stopping people from getting crofts at the moment is the price of them. Um, the price of crofts has just rocketed. And we're arguing that being a regulated system um, should count for something here. You know, everything in crofting is regulated except for the price. And, the regulator could be doing a lot more to help control the prices and not necessarily through you know direct um price intervention which is possible as well you know there's in other parts of the country local authorities have um taken matters into their own hands and have protected housing stock you know and, and say right you know that a certain proportion of the housing stock has to be reserved for the local um, population because it's becoming unsustainable. And this is what's happening with land um, in the Highlands and Islands and croft land that's being sold at prices that local people and young families have no hope at all of competing with um, people coming in with capital behind them. Right. And, and you know, I, I don't want to get caught in in 
the idea that we have something against people coming in from outside because we don't at all and as as stan said you know a lot of, there's a lot of people that have come into crofting that that have made absolutely excellent first class crofters so and you know so that so it's not about that it's it's simply about um prices are being pushed up in an open market and a regulated system was never really designed to be in an open market. Yep, yep. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's the, the story of, um, I guess, of people with uh, well, moneyed people being able to afford to come in and uh, at the expense of the locals. Uh, it's, um, yeah, I can understand that. I, got a, I think we'll maybe take one further question. Uh, Carolyn uh, McGill says, uh, uh, if we've got time, uh, is there, uh, there is funding available for crofting. Is it useful and is it fit for purpose? Funding available for, for crofting. Are you, sorry, Karen, are you, are you referring to like, like crofting grants? Carolyn? Yes, I was uh, thinking about uh, grants and there is some more being um, announced for 2022. And I wondered if it was too small or just not designed for crofting. The, well, there's a, there's, there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a, um, What's the word I'm thinking of? There's a there's a mixture of responses to that because there's a mixture of grants. There, there are some crofting grants that were designed specifically for crofting, um, like for example the Croft House Grant Scheme, um, and another one is the Croft Agricultural Grant Scheme. And these these two are specifically crofting grants and work on the whole. Um, very well for crofting. The Croft House Grant Scheme um, went through quite a, a um, comprehensive review and rewriting of it, and it works a lot better than it than it than it used to. And the the Crofting Agricultural Grant Scheme um, is also under review now. It's sort of got paused for various reasons, but it's it's that review should be carried out um, fairly imminently, I think. And, and that will help that to, to, to work better. Um, there are other there are other grants that are that aren't specifically crofting grants that are that are wider ones. And I think maybe you're referring to, for example, the um, agroecology um, um, agro yeah, agro environment um, grant the AECS, and um, and the, it was announced just recently that 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 will be refunded um, for for the next year. And I think that's probably what you're referring to. Um, we're not over enthusiastic about this, N not not because of um, you know what it is. I mean, the, having an agri an agri-environment scheme should be really good and it's great that the government are putting money into this but the trouble is that the way the scheme is designed is very uncroft friendly and very un, un smallholder friendly it's very difficult to get into it and it's and it is worked on a sort of point system um so large industrial um holdings can pay consultants to, to um, do the application and, and you know, on the whole, small holdings and, and crofters just feel excluded from it. So, so in answer to your question, it's a bit, a bit of this and a bit of that. The crofting schemes work okay. And um, the wider agriculture schemes tend to, on the whole, be targeted at the, at the large, um, farming businesses and um, don't work so well for crofting. Uh, 
Right. I think we're, uh, we've overrun quite a bit. Uh, I didn't want to stop it because the conversation was very interesting. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to do a few thank yous at the end here. Uh, thank you to, uh, to Lucia for, uh, for pulling this together and for getting in touch with you in the first place, Patrick, uh, and making this a, a very interesting topic to, to look at. I'd like to thank Vicky for, um, uh, for stepping in to be the, the moderator. Uh, and we did not cover the other topic that she'd been writing about, fortunately. <laughs> next time. <laughs> yeah, next time. <laughs> I, and of course, thanks to you uh, in particular, Patrick, because you, you've provided the, um, uh, all, all of the information that, uh, that, that we need uh, to be able to understand more about exactly what's happening in the, the crofting environment. Uh, there are a number of, of, sort of misconceptions as to what people would think crofting is about, as you pointed out, uh, and I think you've, you've blown those misconceptions away, uh, and I think we, we, we now understand exactly what, uh, what crofting's about and what some of the challenges are uh, involved in, in crofting itself. So thanks very much uh, and thanks to everybody for attending. Uh, th there is another um, Zoom that we've, we've got coming up with, uh, 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 with um, uh, Wendy Barry's uh, partner, uh, Bossy, Bussy, uh, who's going to talk about some of the uh, some aspects of climate control, uh, maybe a few myths uh, and some realities about that. And that's coming up on the 8th of November. Uh, that should be in our newsletter and, and we'll be sending some more information around uh, on that, uh, either with social media or by email. But again, thanks very much, Patrick. It was fascinating and um, good luck with, uh, with, with all of the campaigning that you are doing to try and improve uh, the world of crofting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>